Did you know that someone in the United States has a stroke every 40 seconds? And every four minutes, someone dies of a stroke. It's no surprise then that stroke comes in as one of the top leading causes of long-term disability in the United States. And it's an important practice area for occupational therapy and one that I'm really excited to talk to you guys about today. Hi everyone, it's been a long time. Welcome back to the OT Miri channel. My name is Miri, I'm a licensed occupational therapist. And in today's video, I'll be talking about stroke and some main functional impairments you may see with patients who have had a stroke. Now, because of the sheer volume of content that'll be covered in just this video alone, uh, I'll be saving assessment and intervention for another video next time, not today. Now, I've been wanting to make a video on stroke for a really long time, like three years, <laughs> but also resisted because there's just so much content from learning the anatomy to the pathophysiology and intervention. So I was torn because on the one hand, I wanted to make this like really short and simple, sweet overview for you guys. But I also knew that there really isn't a shortcut to understanding and really learning the complexities of this condition. So in the end, at least for me, um, I decided to get into the trenches and really study the different and wide variety of ways that stroke can affect our functioning. And unfortunately, memorization just won't be good enough for learning neurological conditions. So this video is going to be a tad bit long, but stay with me. Let's get through this together. And um, be sure to check the video description for links to all the resources that I love and found to be very helpful. Um, some of which are actually just for motivation and inspiration. I still go back to a lot of these resources. Um, when I want to refresh my memory or I just find myself feeling stuck and want to be inspired. So that'll all be listed below, okay? All right, so let's get started. There's a lot to cover. Like I said, so I want you guys to get comfortable and take your mind to a happy place because you'll absorb a lot more and retain better when you're feeling relaxed. We know that, right? So um, what is a stroke? Well, the medical term for stroke is cerebrovascular accident, and it's characterized by neurological deficits that occur when a blood supply to the brain is interrupted or impaired and oxygen cannot get to our brain. And this is bad news because our brain needs constant and constant supply of oxygen, which is carried in the blood through our blood vessels. So when this rich oxygenated blood is cut off or interrupted, the brain won't get the oxygen it needs and the brain tissues in that area will begin to die. And that's how we get stroke. So what causes this impairment of blood flow? Um, what is a mechanism by which our blood supply to the brain gets cut off or interrupted? Well, there are two main causes, mechanisms, and these strokes are actually classified by these mechanisms. So the first way that our blood flow can be interrupted is through a blockage in the blood vessel, like a blood clot. So you can think of it like a clog in the pipe of the drain where everything gets blocked. So when you get a blockage in your blood vessel, it'll obstruct the flow of blood to the brain. And this type of stroke is called ischemic stroke, which accounts for um, about 87% of all strokes. And um, there are two types of ischemic stroke. I'll go over them very briefly, thrombotic and embolic stroke, uh, both of which have to do with some sort of blockage in our blood vessel. Uh, with a thrombotic stroke, you have a thrombus, hence the name thrombotic stroke. And thrombus is just a medical term for blood clot. So it's a blood clot that develops in the artery supplying blood to the brain, obstructing blood flow. And this type of stroke is often seen in older patients, especially those with um, high cholesterol and atherosclerosis. Now, a second type of ischemic stroke is called an embolic stroke. And this is due to a blood clot that forms somewhere else in the body and it travels, um, ultimately getting lodged or stuck somewhere um, on its path 
to uh, the brain obstructing blood flow. So the key thing to know here is that an embolus is basically any floating or moving particle like fat, cholesterol, plaque, or any foreign body um, that leaves its site of origin and it travels in the bloodstream. So mm, a thrombotic stroke occurs when a thrombus or a blood clot develops and blocks blood flow at the site where it originated. It stays there and it blocks it. Uh, when this thrombus breaks off and it starts to move and eventually uh, gets lost somewhere while it's traveling away from its site of origination, you have an embolic stroke, uh, embolic stroke. So I know I spent a bit of time on that actually more than I wanted to, but this was actually always very confusing for me when I was in school. So I wanted to help make that distinction clear between the two types of ischemic stroke. Now, um, in both of these ischemic stroke types, there's an occlusion, like I said, right, or blockage somewhere in the blood vessel. Um, and that's why for ischemic stroke, you guys, uh, thrombolytic agents like TPA, uh, it's short for tissue plasminogen activator, uh, are used as first line of treatment in the acute medical management. So it's not something that we do, but it's still important for us to know. And you can think of TPAs like clot busters that work to dissolve the clot that's blocking the blood flow, basically opens up the occluded vessels and restores blood to the uh, ischemic areas. And time is brain. So we want to get this in as soon as possible. So as for uh, the window of time that is most effective, there's actually ongoing research and the exact treatment protocols uh, continue to get defined and redefined as we learn more. But the use of a three hour window from the onset of symptoms have shown fair favorable outcomes. So helpful hint here, if you're ever with a patient or loved ones experiencing a stroke, note the time of symptom onset, because one of the first questions that will be asked at the hospital is, what time do the symptoms appear? All right. So um, now let's move on to the second major type of stroke, the major classification, which is um, hemorrhagic stroke. And this accounts for around 13% of all strokes. So it's far less common than ischemic strokes. And that's a good thing because hemorrhagic strokes have a much higher rate of morbidity and mortality. So in this type of stroke, a uh, weakened blood vessel ruptures and it bleeds into the brain tissue or into the spaces around the brain. So here, instead of a blockage in the vessel, like you have with the ischemic stroke, you have a breakage in the vessel. So if we were to go back to using that pipe as an example, a hemorrhagic stroke is like having a a leaky or busted pipe that ultimately breaks as opposed to a cloth pipe in ischemic stroke. Okay. Now when that bleeding goes into the brain tissue, we call that intracerebral, which often results from hypertension. So chronic or severe hypertension. Um, it can also be caused by arterial venous malformation, AVM. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's basically like uh, your blood vessels when they form abnormally and they become all tangled. And over time, these tangled blood vessels get weak and can burst. So hypertension and um, AVM are common causes of intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, but you can also have bleeding in the subarachnoid space, space and um, subarachnoid hemorrhage is usually caused by ruptured aneurysm, which as you know, um, occurs when you have abnormal ballooning or bul uh, bulge in the weakened wall of the blood vessel, right? And it breaks. So so these are some of the causes, um, and there are other ones that I won't be going over in this video, but these are some of the main causes of hemorrhagic stroke. Now, usually with a hemorrhagic stroke, it'll come on suddenly and the person will complain about a very bad headache. They might say it's like the worst headache of their life. And I remember this one by remembering President Roosevelt, who is reported to have said, uh, I have a terrific pain. Who calls their pain terrific? <laughs> I have a terrific pain in the back of my head uh, before collapsing and dying later that day. And he had suffered a massive cerebral hemorrhagic stroke. So um, now for something like a hemorrhagic stroke, <laughs> would the patient still be given a thrombolytic agent like TPA? No, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, thrombolytic agents uh, work to dissolve a blood clot and there's no blood clot to dissolve here with a bleeding hemorrhagic stroke. And one of the major risks of administering TPA is bleeding. So 
probably wouldn't be a solid plan for patients that's already bleeding in the brain, right? So that's why when a patient comes in with a stroke, they're like rushed to get imaging done first uh, to rapidly determine whether or not there is a bleeding because if it's hemorrhagic, um, the treatment and medical management will look very different. Um, so that was a review of two major types of stroke. And before I move on to risk factors, I want to briefly mention um, also transient ischemic attacks, TIA. They're sometimes referred to as a mini stroke. And transient means temporary. And we now know what an ischemic stroke means. Ischemic means there's some sort of blockage. So a transient ischemic attack is a temporary blockage leading to obstruction of blood flow. So like ischemic strokes, TIAs are often caused by blood clots. And since, since it's transient, um, it'll usually resolve within an hour to several hours. But unlike ischemic strokes, which leaves you with tissue damage, there's actually no infarction with TIA, so no lasting damage. However, uh, TIA is a serious warning sign that you can have a stroke. And if I remember correctly, more than a third of people who have a TIA actually go on to have a stroke within one year if they don't get treatment. So not something to take lightly because a diagnosis of TIA can lead to medical interventions that can ultimately prevent an eventual stroke, right? So now let's go over some uh, risk factors beginning with non-modifiable risk factors. So things you can't control or change to reduce your risk of having a stroke. For one, age, uh, no one, no one can stop aging. <laughs> With an increase in age, your risk for stroke goes up, and that's for both men and women. Secondly, your gender. Unfortunately for me, women have a higher lifetime risk of stroke than men, and it kills more women than men. Um, your race is another non-modifiable risk factor. Um, African Americans are disproportionately affected, experiencing higher risk of death. Uh, from a stroke than Caucasians. And also, um, what is it? Your family history. Your family history and genetics also matter. So if your parent, grandparent, sister, brother has had a stroke, um, especially before reaching age 65, you may be at greater risk. Um, finally, someone who's had a stroke has a much higher risk of having another one than those who have not had one. So a prior history of having had a stroke is also a non-modifiable risk factor since you can't change your past. But it's not all gloom and doom. There are still many things we can do to risk our chances of having a stroke. And we can do that by working on modifiable risk factors. So these are things we can control or change. So let's go over them. These are the uh, hopeful ones. The first one is hypertension. <sighs> hypertension, you guys, is one of the most important modifiable risk factor because it's the leading cause of stroke. Um, other non-modifiable risk factors include diabetes, hyperlipidemia, uh, smoking, obesity, and um, physical inactivity as well. Oh my goodness, I have so many of these. <laughs> And heart disorders, such as atrial fibrillation, as we discussed earlier, also increases the risk of having a stroke. So cardiovascular risk reduction, including um, treating hyperlipidemia, is an important part of reducing our risk for stroke. Now, one of the best ways you can quickly detect symptoms of a stroke uh, is by using the acronym of FAST. Um, F is for facial drooping. Does one side of the face droop or is it numb? Ask the person to smile. Is this person's smile uneven? Is it even? And A is for arm weakness. So is one arm weak or numb? Uh, you can ask the person to raise both arms. Does one of the arms drift downward? And you'll hear the term arm drift a lot, right? Um, that's when one arm drifts downward. And S is for speech, speech difficulties. Um, is there trouble speaking or understanding speech? Is the speech slurred? And finally, T for time. Um, because if you see these signs, it's time to call 911. Uh, there are certainly other symptoms and signs. And if you'd like to hear a firsthand account from someone who's experienced this, oh my goodness, you guys, there's a great TED Talk. It's not too long. I think it's about 10 minutes. And a book by a neuroanatomist. So this is someone who literally studies the brain and how it works, a brain scientist. 
named Jill Taylor. And what are the odds that she experienced stroke and delivers a remarkable, witty, funny, powerful firsthand account of experiencing a stroke? Uh, I cried and laughed, laughed through it. It's, it's great. It's called My Stroke of Insight. So um, take a listen when you want a break. All right, so we're going to shift gears now and talk about some functional impairments. So everything I talked about up to this point, it's important to know, it's good to know, but this is really where I think we need to have a great understanding uh, because it's where we can really make impact as OT practitioners uh, because we play such a huge role in stroke rehabilitation. So to start, let's first go through motor impairment, which can present with hemiparesis or hemiplegia. Now, paresis refers to weakness and plesia refers to paralysis. So the impairment can range from a mild weakness to a complete paralysis. And one way um, I like to remember paresis is by associating the word paresis with preserved, paresis preserved, because it's not a complete paralysis. You have some preservation. So think of preserved with paresis and remember that with some preservation, paresis is less severe than plesia. And the word hemi and hemiparesis or hemiplegia means it's affecting only one half of the body. And it's on the side that's contralateral to the hemisphere of the brain with the lesion. So that's the side of the body opposite from where there was a lesion, which means if you have a lesion in the left hemisphere, you'll have right hemiplegia and a lesion in the right hemisphere will produce left hemiplegia. Okay, so given this weakness, what do you think might be some functional limitations? Well, for one, you'll observe malalignment in the pa uh, patient's posture immediately after stroke. And this can be due uh, not only to weakness, but also muscle imbalance, as well as effects of gravity too. Um, but this malalignment and the effects of it will be especially evident in the loss of trunk and postural control. You guys, this may not seem like a big deal right now if you've never dealt with it, uh, dealt with it, because we don't ever think about the role our trunk plays into our everyday movement. But our, our trunk control is what allows us to change our body position, shift weight, control movement against gravity, reach out to grab things within or outside our arm reach without falling over everywhere. So from dressing, toileting, bathing, grooming to eating, we use our trunk control pretty much to perform just about all of our ADLs. And research shows a clear association between trunk control and um, functional independence. But in patients with stroke, what you'll see is poor trunk control that leads to poor sitting balance, that slum posture with uh, trunk flexion and posterior pelvic tilt. Uh, malalignment and difficulty adjusting the trunk to arm movements, all of which makes falls and injuries that much more likely. So restoring trunk control as well as sitting balance is one of the main goals in stroke rehabilitation. And we'll be talking more about this in part two of my stroke series where I'll go over um, treatment and intervention, but trunk control, postural control, very important. What else? Um, well, in addition to poor sitting balance, patients with weakness will also have challenges with activities that require lower extremities. And that's because when you're standing, the weakness won't support the weight of your body, which will affect the patient's ability to bear weight through the affected leg. Now you throw in spasticity, weakness, uneven weight distribution through the lower extremities. And, um, oh, fear of falling, which is very real. Uh, do you think this person would be able to assume and maintain upright standing posture or shift weight? <laughs> That'd be challenging, right? So what you'll often see is an asymmetrical posture and weight distribution, as well as poor upright stability, which will not only increase their risk for falls, but also significantly impact their ability to do all the functional tasks that require both static and dynamic standing, like cooking, doing the dishes, reaching over to get something from the cabinets. And I mean, the list goes on, it's endless. Um, another set of challenges that comes after stroke, and these are really important too, are impaired postural reactions and postural strategies which are really crucial for balance and maintaining upright postural control. And you guys, if you don't know or remember what these uh, postural reactions and strategies are, I would highly recommend that you fam familiarize yourself with them uh, because they're pretty important. 
Actually, let me just go over them real quick because we're going to need to know them anyway when we talk about intervention in the next video. So basically, in short, patients with a stroke typically have postural imbalance and impaired postural adjustment strategies. And these include the ankle strategies, uh, the hip strategy, and the stepping strategy. You might have read them or learned them in the school. Um, and you will most often notice these deficits manifest um, in our patients and their ability, inability to maintain or restore their balance again when their equilibrium is thrown off somehow. It could be thrown off in a small way or thrown off in a big way. And that's because maintaining our balance requires spontaneous automatic adjustments. And so this isn't something we do consciously, but everything we do from sitting, staying seated, standing up, moving forward, backward, all require instantaneous adjustments in our sense of balance and requires knowledge of where we are in space. So when we lose that ability, we lose our balance. And remember, these reactions don't just help us in dynamic movement situations. They also help us in static situations because our bodies are um, constantly making these automatic spontaneous adjustments, even when we are just standing still. Um, let me give you some concrete examples so you can get a better idea. So I want everyone to stand up, stand up for a minute with your feet about shoulder width apart and stay standing for a bit. Are you standing? <laughs> it's a good way to take a break too. <laughs> Movement is good for us. Okay, so stand up and now um, just observe. Are you standing absolutely still with no movement at all? This isn't something we think about consciously, and you may not have noticed it, but we're actually moving and swaying in tiny movements. And this is happening at the ankle joint, where the muscles around the ankles activate and moves constantly in slow swaying motion. This, you guys, is called the ankle strategy. And these are employed when there's a very little or a small amplitude of perturbation. So this is known as one of our first line of defenses against falls because it's what helps us stay standing in upright posture by maintaining our center of mass basically over its base of support. And all of this requires strength, range of motion, and um, what's that word? Uh, drawing a blank here. <laughs> proprioception, <laughs> proprioception in the ankles, and the ability to bear weight through the feet. So think about how challenging it would be for our patients with hemiparesis or hemiplegia. Uh, without ankle strategy, our ability to perform standing activities, uh, let alone just stand like waiting in a line in a grocery store or at the concert or standing over the stove to like, you know, nurse your soup and stir will be greatly impacted. Now, when we go beyond small perturbations that our ankles cannot correct, we move on to hip strategy, which gets triggered when there's like big and fast perturbations. So in other words, when you get that sudden and forceful disturbance to your base of support, the muscles around your hips, uh, hip joint will activate in response and move to wherever it needs to go so we don't fall outside our cone of stability. Now, hip strategies also get uh, activated when um, the support surface is too narrow or any surface that's more narrow than your feet. So that can include things like walking on a tight rope or a beam if you're a gymnast or slacklining. Now, when neither ankle nor hip strategies are enough to restore our balance, uh, stepping strategy kicks in to save the day. And this is that dynamic situation I talked about earlier uh, and is triggered when the perturbation is so big, so large, so forceful that we have to take a step to widen our base of support because your center of gravity has been displaced beyond the base of support. Now, an example that comes to mind uh, when I think about stepping strategy takes me back decades back to my college days in Berkeley when I used to take BART to San Francisco. No matter what time of day I got into the train, there was never any seats. And I always found myself standing. And whenever the train came to a sudden halt, uh, I'd stop myself from falling by taking a step. And I never did this with a thought, okay, Mary, time to take a step widen the base of your support so you don't fall. It was just an instant reaction, right? So with the stepping strategy, we are actually modifying our base of support by broadening it. And all of this is happening without much thought because it's an automatic postural reaction that our bodies come equipped with.
So I hadn't planned on talking about this one, but um, if not now, I would have come in the second video. So I'm actually glad I talked about it because these are really important. And you can see how important these are because with patients who've had a stroke, these postural adjustment strategies are impaired and you will notice these deficits manifest in their inability to assume and maintain a posture, standing posture, a proper standing posture, as well as inability to find balance again when their equilibrium is thrown off. So there's an increased risk for falls and a significant impact to their everyday ADLs. Okay. Oh, I'm talking really fast. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to shift gears now and talk about upper extremity impairments. Now, whenever you're learning about postural complication, you'll almost always hear about subluxation of the glenohumeral joint because it's so common. And subluxation is basically a partial dislocation of the shoulder joint where the upper arm bone or the humerus become partially dislocated from the shoulder pocket or socket or the glenofossa. And just as our shoulders move in several directions, displacement can also happen in several directions, meaning it can be inferior, anterior, or superior. Now, when it comes to the mechanism of how subluxation happens after a neurological event like stroke, <laughs> the mechanism remains somewhat controversial, but let's think through this together and see how subluxation can occur with a patient with hemiplegia. So for one, as we discussed earlier, after a patient has had a stroke, what you'll have is this um, muscle weakness, right? And this profoundly affects the patient's ability to actively position the spine and the trunk as well as the arm in upright posture. Now you throw in gravitational pull that's happening on the entire upper extremity, pulling the weight of your heavy flaccid arm. And you don't have the shoulder muscle strength or the ability to recruit appropriate muscles to hold the humerus in place. Now, over time, the weight of the unsupported arm will cause the humeral head to sublux downward into the glenofossa. Another factor to consider is spasticity of the shoulder complex, um, mainly the subscapularis and pectoralis. This pool of the spastic muscles um, can also cause subluxation. Uh, now, one thing I want to mention real quick before I move on is that not all sublux shoulders are painful, and the relationship between shoulder subluxation and pain is really not clear. <laughs> but not all painful shoulders are sublux, and not all sublux shoulders are painful, though pain can exist. Okay. Um, what other post-stroke complications might you see in the upper extremity? Let's see. Um, well, we already talked about this a little bit with subluxation about how our limbs become vulnerable to gravitational pull with weakness. Well, combine that now with acute low tone stage patients undergo after a stroke where there's little to no muscle activity. This is especially bad because this inability to recruit appropriate muscles or maintain muscle activity and strength will result in changes to the resting alignment of our limbs. And you end up with structural changes in the skeletal muscles. So you get this abnormal skeletal muscle basically, which leads to all sorts of other secondary complications like edema. Mm, soft tissue contracture, uh, shortening of muscle, uh, you have overstretching of the joint capsule and the glenohumeral joint, and just overall damage and injury to the joints and soft tissue. And that makes sense, right? I mean, if you have weakness and lack of control or sensation in one side of your body, you can get injured doing pretty much anything. And if you've worked in the neuro setting, you may be familiar with these challenges and have plenty of examples. But if we were to use an arm as an example, when a patient has a weak arm, that arm may just be dangling around, um, getting caught under, over, in between. I mean, it's pretty much at risk of getting pinned or caught on any surface during better wheelchair mobility. Um, I still remember when I was doing stroke rounds during my time at USC, I observed a patient sitting on his hand in like the most awkward way. And just looking at his hand made me cringe inside because it was positioned in such a painful and uncomfortable way. So I think understanding how this combination of weakness and immobility, gravitational pull, the weight of the unsupported arm, and how all of that contribute to abnormal skeletal muscle is really important. 
uh, for us to understand the patient's movement patterns. And this really helps us set the foundation for how we treat our patients. All right, so that's it for upper extremity um, impairment for this video, but if you plan on working in the neuro setting, know that the research and science for evaluating and treating upper extremity impairment never ends, as this is a very complex issue, and there's so much more to be learned than this brief overview I just presented here in this video. All right. What's next? Uh, all right, well, let's switch gears now and go over communication impairments. Um, now, you guys know that I have a separate video on this. It's titled Aphasia on my YouTube channel and website. So I'm going to just breeze through this section, um, starting with global aphasia. Uh, this is the most severe form of aphasia, and it's the loss of all language ability. So it's a global loss spanning all aspects of language. So speaking, understanding, reading, writing. Then there's Broca's aphasia, also known as expressive aphasia, because there's impairment in the expression of language. So you might hear slowed speech, uh, lots of pauses, omission in words, and that uh, cadence and rhythm that accompanies our normal speech will be absent. So to remember this one, think broken with broca. It's broca's broken speech. Now contrast that to Wernicke's aphasia. In Wernicke's aphasia, they talk fluently and speech is produced with no effort, but the person's speech is devoid of meaning and will not make any sense. So where broca's was a deficit in expressive language uh, with trouble speaking, Wernicke's area is primarily involved in comprehension, which is why it's also known as receptive aphasia because of the impairment in auditory receptive. Perception. Finally, we have anomic aphasia, which is difficulty uh, finding and naming words and objects when speaking and writing. And um, patients with anomic aphasia will have difficulty with word retrieval, and uh, they'll also have trouble expressing the words that they want to say. Um, now, these are all very different um, than dysarthria. And dysarthria is a disorder of articulation. So this has more to do with weak or inefficient motor movements that prevent patients from speaking clearly. And it can be from weakness, paralysis, um, incoordination, or involuntary movement of those muscles used for speech. So dysarthria is, a, is in a different category of communication disorder than aphasia. And there are subcategories of uh, dysarthria, like ataxic dysarthria, spastic dysarthria, but uh, we're not going to go through them here because I think that's just too much detail for this intro video. All right. Um, what's next? Perceptual deficits. <laughs> We'll talk about perceptual deficits. Now, I'm gonna cover some of the main ones only that you might see because there's so many and I don't want to spend too much time on this portion. But the first one we'll talk about is uh, spatial relations and positioning. Mm, this one is referring to our ability to know where objects are in space and how they relate to each other. So this one's easy. You just got to think of the word spatial um, with space. So where things are in space and relations with how they relate to each other. And when there's impairment in this area, patients will have trouble perceiving distance um, as well as understanding how and where where to place objects. So you might see a patient who would accidentally knock something over um, because they either overestimated or underestimated distance. Or um, it can clinically manifest as patients having trouble positioning their toothbrush while trying to apply the toothpaste onto the brush. Okay. Then there is spatial neglect. Uh, this is referring to the inability to orient and respond to the contralateral stimuli. In other words, there is a failure to respond to things that is on the side opposite a brain lesion. So if you have damage to the right side of the brain, you will neglect stimuli on the left. And neglect is most commonly seen in uh, patients with a right hemisphere brain damage. So the clinical presentation you'll see typically is neglect on the left side. Um, so you've probably heard this being referred to as left neglect, and this can pretty much affect everything you do in your daily activities. Um, for example, when having a meal, patients with spatial neglect may only eat from the right side of the plate, leaving the entire left side untouched. Um, what other clinical implications might you see? Well, for patients that are still in the hospital, we, might, we have to consider that they may not be able to 
the find a call button that's on the left side of the wall, right? And this is why you may see OTs using compensatory strategies initially, uh, moving and placing important items like call button and phone on the left side. Now, I want to quickly mention that spatial neglect is not the same as having a visual field deficit, although they're often confused and can look alike. A uh, patient with stroke may certainly have a visual field deficit, but remember, spatial neglect on one side uh, is more about deficits in visual attention and scanning. So uh, neglect is a disorder of inattention, which is why you might sometimes hear neglect being referred to as hemi-inattention because patients with a spatial neglect will not make an attempt to direct search toward the neglected side. All right, so we'll talk more about this later when we talk about visual impairments. But for now, please remember that neglect is not the same thing as visual field deficit, though they can coexist. And being able to diagnose them properly will be important because treatment will look different depending on whether you have challenges with inattention uh, versus an actual cut in your visual field. Okay. Now, what happens when um, neglect occurs within our own personal space? Um, body neglect. So this is when the patient neglects his own body on the contralateral side. So what you might see here is patient shaving only half of the face and leaving the other side untouched or not washing the affected side. Uh, but this deficit can affect so much more beyond just grooming because neglecting the affected side can also mean that you're not using the affected limbs appropriately. So body neglect can affect things like mobility too, because patients may not integrate the the entire left side of their body during bed mobility and transfers. Uh, so that's body neglect and it can present a lot of challenges. All right, now um, let's take a look at this image here. Um, can you recognize what kind of animal this is? Her body is somewhat contorted and in a position that is not typical to what you may see regularly, but can you still tell what it is? How about this one? <laughs> were you re able to recognize these images as an image of a dog, even though they were placed in all the different positions? Well, you probably did because you have the ability to identify objects despite variations from the norm, meaning a change in size or shape or color, location or position won't affect your ability to recognize the object, right? This is called form constancy. And for people who've suffered a stroke, this ability may be lost and they'll have difficulty recognizing an object when it changes or varies from its normal position or size or shape. So for an example, a cup that's turned upside down or a computer that's placed, I don't know, toppled over and is placed on its side or a pen or pencil that's three times larger than its size. So to remember this one, just remember the meaning of the word constant. Constant refers to a situation or a state of affairs that doesn't change, right? So form constancy is knowing that the object has not changed despite its change in size, shape, or position. All right, let's look at a different image now. Um, here, I want you to uh, see if you can locate the scissors. This is my kitchen utensil drawer that I just organized. <laughs> it was a clutter mess, embarrassing. So um, I cleaned it up for you guys. Did you guys find it? This is called figure ground discrimination. It's the ability to distinguish objects in the foreground from objects in the background. So in other words, uh, it's differentiating or locating an object from its natural background. And patients with figure ground difficulty may not be able to find a knife from a drawer full of utensils like you just did. Uh, what other examples can you think of for figure ground discrimination? How about a dresser full of different clothes? <laughs> Can you imagine how hard it'd be to locate a pair of socks in a drawer full of all different items in the foreground and the background? Um, how about sorting and matching your socks during laundry? I mean, you can see how this can impact so many things in our ADLs, right? Uh, another example in the bathroom is trying to find your toothbrush that's mixed in with all the cluttered items on the sink. Well, maybe your sink is not cluttered. Mine is so cluttered. It's, <laughs> I mean, the list goes on. All right, so next one, let's look at this image. Can you see my little dog Stella in this image? The rest of her body is covered by my dress and you can only see her head, which is also positioned sideways, but can you still recognize that this is a dog? How about this one? 
Um, do you see it even though it's partially covered? This, you guys, is visual closure, which is the ability to accurately um, identify objects that are partially covered or missing. So even if there is like an incomplete representation, a missing piece, this ability helps you quickly make sense of what you see and identify the object, even if the entire object is not all visible to you. Uh, so this means that you do not have to see every detail in order to recognize something, which is what allowed you to quickly locate my dog and the apple and the images I just showed you. But for patients who have difficulty with visual closure, they'll have trouble completing the image that's partially covered or missing, uh, like the dog on my lap or the apple that was partially covered. But other real life examples include ability to identify objects while in the community. So think about how many traffic light signs or signs do you come across when you're driving. And many of these are actually often hidden behind a tree or covered partially by buildings and other structures. Now, what would happen if you can complete this image in your head because it's partially covered? these traffic signs and lights. I mean, not good, right? So to remember this one, um, I like to think of the word closure because one of the definitions of that word is finding a sense of resolution or conclusion at the end of something. So when you find closure, you will have closed out and finished something. In that way, visual closure is when you find resolution by completing the missing piece in your mind's eye to complete the incomplete representation. Does that make sense? All right, so next, we're gonna talk about uh, different types of agnosia, starting with visual agnosia. Now, visual agnosia is when a patient is unable to identify objects by looking at it, although they have normal visual foundation skills. So the patient's vision and visual perception are intact, but they'll have difficulty recognizing or naming familiar objects. So patients with visual agnosia may have to hold the object and use tactile cues, you know, through touch, or they can use their sense of smell to smell it if it has a distinguishable smell like wine, like flour to identify the object. Now, to remember the term visual agnosia, remember the root words, um, A is without and gnosis means knowledge. So without knowledge, um, people with visual agnosia do not have knowledge of the object because they can't recognize it, even while actually looking and seeing the object. Um, and now that you know the root word meaning for agnosia, it'll be easier to know and remember other forms of agnosia. So for example, color agnosia, um, as the name implies, is the inability to recognize color uh, despite intact color perception. So even though your eyes may be capable of distinguishing the colors, the world might uh, be seen in shade of gray, black, or white. Uh, so think of how hard it would be to drive, especially with traffic lights when you have color agnosia. Uh, then there's tactile agnosia, which is the inability to recognize common objects by touch or tactile manipulation, although basic tactile sensation is intact. And many of us done this, um, have done this while driving, and I'm definitely guilty of it. But have you ever reached into your bag or purse to find something without like looking? <laughs> You're like fishing around for it. Well, the seemingly simple ability to identify something by touch alone without visual input is compromised in patients with tactile agnosia. All right. Um, and then there is, oh, somatoagnosia, which is a disorder of body scheme. And uh, this comes from the root word somato, which means body. This is where the patient fails to recognize their own body parts and how they relate to each other. So uh, this is a strange one. So with somatoagnosia, uh, patients may put their arms in through the leg holes when they're dressing. Or um, if you're working with them, they might even try to put your arm into their shirt in the process of trying to get dressed. So there's a disconnect somewhere here with the body scheme and the inability to recognize their own body part, uh, which can present so many challenges in um, everyday ADLs. Then there is prosopagnosia. Uh, this one is the inability to recognize faces, uh, which makes sense because the origin of the word proso means face. Not surprisingly then, uh, this deficit is sometimes referred to as facial blindness. And in some cases, 
patients may not even recognize their own face in the mirror or in the photo. And, uh, you know, the way I remember this one is to just think of the word prosa, person, since prosa looks and sounds somewhat like a person. So inability to recognize a person's face. Okay. Uh, finally, I want to talk about anosognosia. Uh, this one is referring to a lack of understanding, insight, or awareness of your conditions. So um, to remember this term, just think of the root words again. A means without, nozo means disease, and nausea is knowledge. So in this case, without knowledge of the disease. Now, at first glance, this may not seem like a big deal. You might think, oh, they're just in denial. They're going through a hard time. But Think about the clinical manifestation and how this lack of awareness can affect someone who has hemiplegia post-stroke. This patient, not realizing that they have an impairment, may overestimate their abilities, making them more likely to engage in potentially risky situations, increasing their risk of falls. Um, this lack of awareness can also show as a uh, lack of concern about the deficit, which would definitely affect their level of motivation to participate in therapy or get better. So it's really important for us to be aware of this condition and to work through these challenges with our patients. Oh my goodness, that was a lot, a lot to digest, a lot to say. <laughs> and I really had uh, trouble uh, studying all this when I was preparing for the exam. But you know, what I didn't have was a study buddy. So hopefully, um, as you're going through these with me, you won't feel too overwhelmed. That's the hope at least, but we're almost done now. So if you're, uh, you know, need to take a break, feel free to pause here. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, I want to uh, quickly go over some cognitive impairments you might see because these deficits are also very common with stroke. And I'm just going to breeze through this session too, because most of these are pretty uh, straightforward. So to start, Let's talk about initiation. Uh, patients who've had a stroke may have difficulty with initiation of an activity or a task or movement. So basically starting something, starting an activity. Um, then there is attention, the ability to maintain and sustain focus. And I think this is something we all struggle with to a degree, especially when we're trying to do something, get something done. But here I'm actually talking about the kind of attention deficit that gets in the way of completing what would be a relatively simple task that may not even require like 30 seconds to complete, like brushing your hair, washing your face. Um, this can present as inability to attend to something, but it can also show as inability to drown out or screen out distractions or irrelevant stimuli from our environment. Uh, then there's organization, super simple. We know this word. This is simply the ability to arrange things into order. But more specifically, in our context of how we work, this is the ability to organize in order to perform the task efficiently and engage in meaningful tasks. So remember, we are occupational therapy practitioners. So we're always looking at skills and abilities that affect our ability to perform meaningful and purposeful tasks, right? So in the kitchen, this skill might look like taking out all the ingredients you need at the same time from the refrigerator. Or in the workspace, it might look like gathering all the materials you need, like paper, pencil, notebook, um, everything you need to take notes. Okay. Uh, similarly, sequencing. Sequencing is another executive function deficit you may see related to completing a task. Uh, sequencing is the ability to complete the steps of a task in the right order. Um, and finally, we see challenges in the area of problem solving. So this is the ability to find solutions and solve problems. So uh, let's put all these deficits together and see how they might affect the simple task of putting on our shoes, as an example. First, you have to uh, initiate the task and start the process of putting on your shoes, right? So the initiation, then you have to stay focused and keep your attention on the task at hand without getting distracted or getting drowned out by other things in the environment, other distractions. And then you have to organize by getting everything you need, like shoes and socks. And then after that, you have to sequence this task and all the steps involved uh, by first putting on the socks, then shoes, then tying your shoelaces. And when you mess up or come across a challenge, like realizing that you forgot to put on your socks before putting on your shoes, then you have to figure it out and problem solve. Um, these are things that you and I do without a thought, but there's actually really a lot that goes into an activity. 
as simple as putting on a pair of shoes. And lucky for our patients, we are trained in activity analysis and can break this down and help them. So um, these are some cognitive impairments, and they're definitely important for us to know. Okay, um, moving on. Next, we're going to talk about apraxia. And um, this is another video that I have already on YouTube and on my website. So check that out. I won't go into too much uh, detail here. I'm just going to touch on the subject. But in short, apraxia is a dysfunction where uh, there's a difficulty in performing purposeful, skilled movement. And this uh, deficit is not attributed to or explained by sensory motor deficits or comprehension deficits. And um, one type of apraxia you may see is ideational apraxia, which occurs when there's a breakdown of the ideation or conceptualization process. So patients with ideational apraxia will have no idea uh, or they won't have the right idea on how to perform a task or how to conceptualize a multi-step movement. So they'll have trouble using objects appropriately because they've lost the perception of the object's purpose. So in the clinical setting, you may see a patient trying to write with a spoon or using a comb to brush the teeth. Now compare that to idiomotor apraxia. This is also referred to as motor apraxia commonly. Um, unlike ideational apraxia, where the patient has no idea what to do, a patient with idiomotor apraxia will know what to do and will be able to explain what the purpose of the task is, but um, the patient cannot produce the movement despite having the sensory and motor skills to perform the task upon command. So you may observe a patient performing a certain movement or action automatically in context, but you ask them to do it again later um, and they'll have a hard time mimicking or completing the planned movement. Really interesting stuff. Uh, finally, there's um, construction a constructional apraxia. And this one's easy to remember if you think of a construction worker building on a house because constructional apraxia is referring to the inability to assemble uh, pieces or parts into a two or three dimensional whole, like assembling uh, furniture or organizing food in the pantry or anything else that requires putting or assembling pieces together to form a whole. Okay, so that was a quick review of apraxia. Uh, now we're gonna go on to visual impairments. Now earlier, when we were talking about spatial neglect, I briefly noted how spatial neglect is not the same as visual field deficit, right? Well, uh, let's first begin by talking about one of the most common visual field deficits, homonymous hemianopia. You might hear it as homonymous hemianopia too. And this one is important to know because homonymous hemianopia is the most common um, type of visual field loss and stroke is the most common cause of hem homonymous hemianopia. So what is it? Um, this is a complete loss of visual field on the same side in both eyes. So you can either have two right or the two left halves of the visual fields, meaning uh, the patient sees only one side, right or left of the visual world of each eye. It's such a bizarre condition, and the, the patient who has a left homonymous hemianopia, for example, may think that they're just or th that they've just lost vision in their left eye, when in fact they've lost vision in the left half of each eye. So this presents a real challenge because now uh, the patient thinks that their whole world that they see is the remaining half that they're seeing. And as you can imagine, this can significantly affect a patient's ability to carry out his ADLs and IADLs because they cannot recognize that there are moving objects or obstacles in their missing visual field. Uh, this makes it very difficult to move from one place to another, especially when they're navigating an unfamiliar environment. Um, so imagine how hard driving would be. I mean, I don't think you could drive with this uh, condition unless you really received a lot of therapy and treatment for it because half of your visual field was cut and you couldn't see pedestrians or cars coming into intersection. I mean, even simple things like taking a walk around the neighborhood could be challenging because you couldn't navigate all the obstacles. So there's definitely an increased risk for falls as you bump into things or knock things over. Okay, and now there are other visual impairments that can occur with stroke, and um, these include like eye movement disorders, like saccades, uh, you may hear it as saccades, um, pursuits, 
burdens, accommodation, and fixation. Um, I'll go over them very quickly. Um, Saccades are like rapid eye movement that occurs when the eyes move from one point to another in the visual field. It's basically like rapid ballistic shifts or jumping gaze from one part of the visual field to another in order to change the point of fixation. So basically going from looking at one thing to another rapidly. And you know what I always think of or imagine when I think about psychotic eye movements? Cats, <laughs> these cute little cats, their eyes are always jumping from one fixation to another. I mean, they're like masters at it, right? In contrast, smooth pursuit movement. So in smooth pursuit, the eyes move smoothly and it's used to follow a, uh, or track a moving target. So it's a much slower tracking movement of the eyes that helps us keep our focus on a moving target. Then there's a vergence, which is the ability to aim the eyes at a target and track it as it moves closer towards you or away from you. And when the eyes are moving uh, to track the object as it's coming closer, it's called convergence. And it's when our eyes move inward to focus on a nearby object, like reading, working on a computer or looking at your phone. And so when you have convergence insufficiency, your eyes have trouble working together and they don't turn in or converge while focusing on an object that is close by in midline near your face. Now, divergence is the opposite of convergence is the ability to turn both of your eyes um, outward to look at a distant object. And we can test for divergence and sufficiency by moving the target further away and seeing if both eyes remain fixed on the same target. Um, and affected patients will often experience double vision when viewing um, distant objects. Then there is accommodation, um, which is the ability to, uh, for the eyes to maintain um, as well as change focus when looking at different distances. So uh, in the way that a camera changes focus for various distances, our eyes need to change focus when we change focus too. So right now you're looking at me, you're watching me on the screen, which if you're sitting on a desk might be like 16 to 20 inches from your face. Well, look up real quick from your screen and like look at something um, in the distance, like a wall on the clock, um, the, the clock on the wall and come back to the screen real quick. Uh, when you quickly shift your gaze and change focus from near to far and then from far to near, uh, were you able to bring these images into clear focus quickly? Well, that's accommodative facility. And uh, there are other type of uh, accommodative dysfunction, but we won't go into all of them here, but it's basically your ability to bring to clear focus things at different distances. And the last one we'll talk about is fixation. You can tell I'm talking really fast now because I'm getting tired and um. <laughs> my voice is going. <laughs> it's just as the word implies, fixation. It's the ability to fixate on something visually, like looking at a painting at a museum or observing that painting or anything in detail with focus and a steady gaze. So it's basically the ability to hold your eyes steady and maintain focus on whatever it is that you're looking at. Okay, so that's all we'll talk about for visual deficits. Finally, um, very quickly, let's talk about psychosocial component um, of stroke recovery. As we just learned, stroke can leave a patient with debilitating impairment and people often lose the ability to do things that they were able to do so effortlessly. And as people whose um, our identities are so often and so indelibly linked with the work that we do and the role that we play, a stroke can really have devastating consequences on the patient's sense of self and identity as they try to relearn how to do the most simple tasks again. So the incidence of depression, anxiety, mania, um, even personality disorders are quite common. And while physical therapy of the body, the physical body is important, we also know that the mental health component which I think is so often neglected is equally important because if we lose ourselves up here, then everything becomes that much harder, right? So um, that concludes our video for today. But on that note, I want to really encourage you guys uh, while you're studying and going through this very important next step of becoming a therapist, please take breaks and take care of your own mental health. Um, I know that this test is looming before you like the biggest, greatest mountain you must overcome and conquer before you can do anything else. But time stops for no one and tomorrow is never guaranteed, you know, 
um, I recently lost a friend, uh, someone I shared a very deep connection with to hemorrhagic stroke. It's actually what uh, really made me want to make this video. Um, I met this man during my travel through Southeast Asia and like we instantly connected. We were kindred spirits. He was also from LA and was happened, happened to be traveling at the time for his incredible humanitarian work, which he's widely known for. And we kept in touch even through long distance because, you know, we just really connected. And one time he was visiting the States and um, he was staying only 15 minutes away from me. And I wanted to see him, but I was just so busy. Like I kept justifying saying, I'll see him once this very hectic season of my life passes. I had just given birth. The first year was really hard as a new mom. Um, but the next time I heard from him or about him, it was through our mutual friend who let me know that he was in a coma. And I went to see him immediately and again and again, even through the pandemic. Um, but he never woke up and he passed a year later, uh, a year and a half later. And I still wonder, like to this day, um, if he heard my voice when I was talking to him and the words I spoke to him. And did he hear me say, I'm sorry, or, thank you, I love you. And all the things that I wish I could have said to him, you know, before he passed. So I don't know. I share this story because as important as it is to do everything that we prioritize for ourselves today, um, I think we really have to ask ourselves, why are we trying to pass the exam? What is the goal? Isn't it to make a difference, to help people heal and to help them regain their independence in a meaningful and fulfilling way? Well, I think that process of living fully each and every day, it has to begin with us. And we should never put that process on a pause. And every day we have to, we must make time to do something that's meaningful and important and fulfilling for ourselves. Um, whether that's calling somebody that we love to let them know that we love them or finding time to meet up with a friend who you haven't seen in ages because life has gotten so busy. Anyway, so that's our video for today. I really hope this video was helpful to you. Um, I love you guys. Um, take good care and please do something meaningful today that fills your cup, whatever that may be.